So as people are just logging on, we are going to show a short video. It's about five minutes on the concept of regeneration, and then we'll get started. So I'm going to turn my screen off and let you enjoy this brief video. To come together. We're all being called. We, we are being called to be called to come together. To come together. To connect. To connect. To connect. And to regenerate. Regenerate. To connect and to regenerate. This is a call to the citizens of this planet. What is regeneration? What is regeration? Regeneration puts life, 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 life to the, the center, center of every, every act and, and every, every decision. decision. We've inherited an economic system that is extractive and degenerative. Vital connections have been severed between human beings and nature. This disconnection and degeneration has brought us to the brink of an unimaginable crisis. Degeneration is stealing the future. Regeneration is healing, healing. Is healing the future. A regeneration is the only path forward. Regeneration means infusing our towns and our cities with nature. Rewilding our towns, towns and cities. Transportation that cleans the air and calms the spirit. Cleans the air and calms the spirit. Regeneration brings our soils back to our life. Soils back our to soils back to life. Back to life. Regeneration creates locally operated renewable energy systems everywhere. To enable people to take the energy transition into their own hands and make the planet cleaner. Regeneration means bringing First, First Nations, Nations knowledge, knowledge to the forefront. Embracing indigenous, indigenous wisdom, wisdom. Indigenous story, indigenous voices. Essential knowledge systems that we need to live in harmony and address the crisis. Regeneration means giving the young, young people, people the power to, sh to shape their own future. This is what democracy looks like! communities and citizens. Regeneration means restoring our planet's ecosystem, allowing the living world to flourish once more. To me, to me, regeneration means... To me, regeneration means love. Protection. Harmony. Resilience. Loving the life that we've been given on this beautiful planet. Regeneration means knowing the people in my neighborhood and, and living in a safe, safe, strong, and caring community. Regeneration benefits every person, every living being. Respeitar, conservar, proteger, cuidar. We can use what we have in our unique way to take care of this place that we love. Cuidar. Our home. Regeneration is how we can do that. We're all in this together, man. This is a call to the citizens of this planet who want a better future for all living beings. A call, a call to the regenerator. I am striking for climate justice and telling the truth in Russia why it's dangerous to be a climate activist. I power all my contracts with 100% renewable energy. I'm working with farmers to find the best ways to increase soil health and increase biodiversity. I hold our government accountable for their continuous climate denial and undoubtable support for the fossil fuel industry. I hike mountains in high heels to build queer community in the outdoors and to advocate for our one true queen, Mother Nature. We are all being called to come together, to connect, and to regenerate. See, we're moving from an industrial civilization to an ecological civilization. We're all here, alive, in this moment, to make this happen. You are the regeneration. You are the regeneration. You are the regeneration. You are the regeneration. We are the regeneration. We are the regeneration. We are the regeneration. We are the regeneration. Somos a floresta. Somos os rios. Nós somos a regeneração. This is the regeneration.
All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, um, for watching that short video. And uh, I'm just going to get started in a moment here. Bear with me. All right. Well, good evening. My name is Tara Pisani Garo, and I'm the director of Boston College's Environmental Studies Program. So, sorry. <laughs> so, I've been working with an interdisciplinary team of faculty at Boston College to help bring to you across this entire year a, a very special series that we call Rewilding Planet Earth. And it's supported by a grant from the Institute for Liberal Arts. Tonight's event is co-sponsored with the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. So this series, Rewilding Planet Earth, invites us to take seriously the biodiversity extinction crisis and its connection to climate change, to cultivate a positive, regenerative relationship with nature, and to participate in the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. The series emphasizes both the need to be as informed as possible and to stay engaged through shared action, community involvement, and a commitment to the common good. So the next event is on Wednesday, April 27th at 4.30 p.m. with David Meshulam, the director of the local nonprofit Speak for the Trees. That will be our last event for this year. And his keynote is entitled Trees as Boundary Objects, Growing Boston's Urban Forest for Equity, Justice, and Resilience. Now, the format for this evening's event is an hour and 15 minute conversation with our esteemed guest, Paul Hawken. And we invite you to participate in the conversation by submitting questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we'll start to take questions from the Q&A at 740. We also wanna let you know that you can get closed captioning by clicking on the uh, live transcript at the bottom of your screen as well. So joining me as moderator this evening is David Story, Associate Professor of the Practice in the Philosophy Department. David teaches environmental ethics courses at BC that directly relate to tonight's conversation, including how to save the world, the ethics of climate change, and energy justice, ethics, economics, and the environment. He hosts a podcast, Wisdom at Work, Philosophy Beyond the Ivory Tower, that features philosophers working in a diversity of spaces outside of the academy. So welcome, David. And David is going to introduce our, our guest tonight. All right. Thanks, Tara. Uh, so Paul Hawken is kind of a big deal, uh, and he doesn't do <laughs> a lot of public talks. So we we're lucky to have him with us tonight. Uh, Paul is an environmentalist, entrepreneur, author, and activist who has dedicated his life to environmental sustainability and changing the relationship between business and the environment. He's one of the environmental movement's leading voices, a pioneering architect of corporate reform with respect to ecological practices, and the author of eight books, five of which were national bestsellers. And as I was looking over his, his background and preparing for tonight, I thought he should really kind of like redesign our business school curriculum, but that's another conversation. <laughs> uh, his book, The Ecology of Commerce, was voted the number one college text on business and the environment by professors in 67 business schools. His book, Natural Capitalism, Creating the Next Industrial Revolution, co-authored with Amory Lovins, has been translated into 14 other languages. Together with the Ecology of Commerce, these books have been described as being, quote, among the first to point the way toward a sustainable global economy. Another of his books, Growing a Business, became the basis of a 17-part PBS series, which Paul hosted and produced. The program which explored the challenges and pitfalls of starting and operating socially responsible companies, appeared on television in 115 countries and reached more than 100 million people. His most recent books, which we'll be talking with him uh, about tonight, are Drawdown, uh, big book. Uh, and I love this subtitle, The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed to Reverse Global Warming and Regeneration. Ending the climate crisis in one generation. So, uh, welcome, Paul. Hey, thank you, David, and thank you, Tara. It's, a, it's it's great to be here. I wish I was there in person, but yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the was, part where you walk on stage and to thunderous applause. Exactly. Um, you know, but this is ecological and kind. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so I'll start us off with the first question. 
Uh, so Drawdown, uh, which I just mentioned, is a comprehensive book on solutions to climate change. Yeah. They're ranked by their potential to reduce CO2 equivalent uh, emissions. Uh, so why a second book on solutions? What knowledge gap uh, did you see regeneration trying to fill? Well, it was always meant to be the sequel. It wasn't an afterthought to Drawdown. Uh, Drawdown is a, as you said, we map measured and modeled the most substantive solutions. Drawdown also had the purpose of naming the goal. And up until then, what we heard is net zero, or we heard mitigation, or we heard, you know, these goals that were fine, but they're thresholds, they're not real goals. Uh, and the goal is to reverse global warming, not to mitigate. And so <clears throat> when you have reasonable, you know, not very um, expansive goals, you know, then you don't tend to get very uh, unreasonable, expansive, you know, activities. You just don't, you know, because it's sort of siloed. And so I want to name the goal because that hadn't been stated uh, uh, out loud. Uh, and uh, so when we hit net zero emissions in 2050, should we hit that? Um, we'll still be in, we'll be in climate chaos even if emissions stay level, you know, for the next 10 years, 20 years. Um, so that's hardly what we want and so forth. So that's drawdown. It was a what to do list. We mapped, measured, and modeled. It was a global look at those solutions. And therefore the data are not really accurate for Boston or for Massachusetts or for Botswana or Belgium, um, because those places are all different and what applies to one place doesn't necessarily necessarily apply to another culture. Uh, but they're broadly uh, accurate in that sense, in terms of, you know, uh, would you say the, the hierarchy of them? I want to go back to that because I think the hierarchy is deceptive, but, but at the same time, it's a what to do list and re regeneration is a how to, as opposed to what, I mean, you can have what to do lists all day long. You know, I want to, I want to get up earlier. I want to meditate. I want to stop eating sugar. I want to, you know, not cut that kind of coffee. You can have these lists, you know, it doesn't mean you do them. And, um, and so how to is what I heard again and again in, I gave, I think 128 speeches in 22 months after drawdown. And what I heard again and again, or, or the question was, you know, what should I do? And, and a very sincere, genuine question, by the way, it wasn't like, you know, what should I do? It was, what should I do? And, and like, I can't do everything. And uh, underlying that question also was, I don't know how to do this. I, I don't know how, you know, and I get the, you know, the urgency and the extraordinary um, uh, nature of the problem, you know, but I don't know what to do. And so I wanted to really address that in two ways. Uh, one is, uh, I wanted to use a word regeneration that was more embracing uh, than sustainability or drawdown or other terms which are conceptual. I mean, they're good concepts, but it, they're still conceptual. And regeneration is inherent in life. It's inherent in you and me. It's inherent in our 20, you know, 37 trillion cells, you know, which are regenerating every nanosecond. It's inherent in how we are in the world because we really do care we care about ourselves we care about our family our children our friends our relatives our neighbors our classrooms our colleges our cities you know uh our churches you know whatever we care you know our dog our cat or this or that we're just we naturally every day spend time caring caring is regeneration when you're caring for life you are supporting its ongoing regeneration and so uh, I felt like the climate conversation, David, has gotten a little, uh, it's full of lingo and jargon, put it that way. And, and people, most people, not the students here, the people attending today, but most people either don't understand the lingo, but, or, or don't ask, you know, uh, or they're just, basically you know tired of hearing it you know one mm five -hmm. c decarbonization carbon pollution you know it's like it, it doesn't doesn't 
take, you know, those words. And we know they have meaning, you know, or, you know, it, you know, nationally determined commitments is another one. That's great, you know, or what does that mean, you know? I mean, we know what those means. Everybody here does who's listening, but, you know, 98% of the people in the world are disengaged. They're not involved with doing anything about the climate, nothing after 50 years of being in the public sphere. And I'm not blaming those people at all. I'm not wag you know, wagging my finger. I'm saying, well, how did we do that? How did we all collectively have, you know, understand the greatest crisis that civilization uh, has ever faced and probably ever will. And at the same time, create a, a language and a narrative that actually where most people either don't know what to do or don't aren't involved or don't have time for it or feel that it's a burden or it's a curse or it's something that they should be guilty about if they don't do. I mean, that's what we've done. And that means we won't solve it. And so regeneration and nexus in the website too, which is very, very important, really it's about, you know, flipping that narrative, you know, it's about life which I love this rewilding and, you know, I mean, it's just so, it's so right, you know, and, and apropos for this book and vice versa, uh, because it's really about bringing life back to earth, you know, and we have had and participated and benefited in material ways from a degenerative extractive economy for a very, very long time. And that means it takes life, it extracts, it takes it, you know, from forests, from oceans, from wetlands, from farmlands, from grasslands, from people, from cultures, from our children, from our health, from, hey, we're just extracting. And then we turn that into capital, then people have money. And that's, <laughs> and the, 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 the difference now than say even five or 10 years ago, but maybe longer for some, but is that we can see that road stops, it ends. It can't, we can't go much further down this extractive degenerative economy. Um, and uh, so regeneration is about saying, can we stop and pivot and go the other way? And the proposal basically is, can we create more life in our, li in our lives, in our work, in, in our society, in our cultures, in our countries, instead of taking more life? I mean, that's what we have to do. Uh, we've taken an awful lot and we're taking it at a rate now that has never been exceeded. It's just extraordinary at the speed with which uh, we're creating uh, degeneration and degradation uh, 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 on species, on places uh, all over the world. And so regeneration is where we're gonna go sooner or later. The question is, it should be a lot later. It should be sooner, it should be now, if we're going to, in a sense, preserve you know, the quality of our life, you know, and a civilization that is worth saving. It's an amazing civilization in many ways. I'm not talking about the damage and the hurt and the harm uh, and the exploitation, you know, and suffering that has caused. We know about that too. Um, but, you know, you wouldn't have Mahler's 10th Symphony or you wouldn't have, you know, you know beautiful <laughs> Japanese poets or, you know, the, these, you know, beautiful, the pyramids, I mean, all these things that humanity has done is just so extraordinary, you know, and our, our cuisine now and our food and our understanding and, you know, the way we, our art and hip hop and all these things are so marvelous and so crazy wonderful, you know, and it's, it's worth saving and it's worth uh, sticking around, you know, and seeing what else we become. And the only way we can do that is to restore life on earth. And the popular assumption is that if we get to net zero emissions, you know, by 2050, let's say, um, that is we stop combusting coal, gas, and oil. We stop putting those greenhouse gases up there. That we get a hall pass, you know, to the 22nd century. And it's just not true. We have to do that without which we cannot get to the 20 second century. But the fact is that we can extract and destroy this world as we are right now, just as easily with renewable energy than fossil fuel energy, you know. So regeneration is really about, as it says in the first sentence, putting life at the center of every action and decision, and then examining it. What does that mean? How would I make clothing if I was doing it that way? What would I buy? You know, what business would I be in? How can I 
create the, the, the services and the goods that human beings need and heat and warmth and safety and mobility and healthcare and so forth. How can we do these things in such a way that doesn't take, but actually gives, you know, that doesn't destroy, but actually creates. We know how to do that. And I, I'd love to have a, con a conversation around rewilding because that's what it's about. That's the perfect segue, I think, to our next question. And you're already getting at it. We really want to understand what that term regeneration means. And in my own circle, which I'm in agroecology, the the new sort of phrase that that's catching like wildfire is regenerative agriculture, which in some ways is a continuum if we think about it from sustainable agriculture actually before sustainable agriculture alternative agriculture then sustainable agriculture and then organic agriculture permaculture biodynamic um, regenerative agriculture now some people in those circles say how do you ensure that when someone says i'm a regenerative business or farm that they are doing those type of practices that put life at the center, um, especially in those fields that are working with life, but may still have environmental externalities. So do you think in any way that that we need a label or how do you make sure that that term doesn't get used for greenwashing and that it's really putting life at the center and restoring ecosystems? What is your thinking on the term in relationship to other words that we've used to to think about that balance, that ecological balance that we're striving for? Well, the good thing is we don't really have to worry about it because it's already been usurped by Monsanto, Bayer, Corteva, Cargill, Bungay, General Mills, and Pepsi. Mm -hmm. So it's already been ab absolutely used in a, in a way that is tantamount to, you know, regen washing or green washing or whatever you want to call it. So that they were quick to that one. Uh, because and the reason I think those companies did it is because they could see darn well that the uh, industrial chemical agriculture methodology that they benefit from in terms of sales and chemicals and pesticides and herbicides and GMO seeds, etc. Uh, is degenerative and that road ends. It's the same thing I said earlier and they could see that. And so they did a quick like, well, how can we keep our business model going? <laughs> And so they went from, you know, like no till to conservate, it's called conservation egg, which is a funny term, but that means you use glyphosate. In other words, you don't till, you just kill. And, and there's nothing regenerative about, you know, phytotoxins, you know, basically, which is what glyphosate is. Um, and so, but the, the, the good news there is that people are scrambling, you know, to find a, a pathway that actually makes sense. And I think every farm in the world is, it knows, not maybe everyone, but they're, they're, the eyes are looking out. They know that, you know, the weather is changing. You know, it's too much water, too little water, too hot, too cold, you know. And uh, for starters, and not to mention, you know, other issues. Uh, too little pollinators. No one's complaining about too many. And so, so I think the whole agricultural world is sort of on edge, you know, and actually aware that they need to engage in a transition. They have to make a transition to agriculture that actually builds soil health since they've been destroying it for a hundred years. Not like meanly or, you know, callously. I mean, they thought they were doing the right thing. And the farmers that I talked to who are transitioning to regenerative ag and so forth, you know, we're very well, they're very well educated. You know, they went to Texas A&M, they went to Davis, they went to all these schools, you know, and they learned well, uh, they're very well. But now there's this, you know, awareness and so forth. In terms of labeling, uh, that's going to be a difficult one uh, because regeneration means different things. If you have a vineyard, an orchard, if you have sheep, if you have a row crop, if you have uh, if you're growing cacao, growing coffee, you know, actually, uh, it, the, the overlying principles apply in terms of increasing, increasing soil health, but I, I, I don't know if there's going to be a certification standard that's going to be work entirely for it. Uh, uh, I went to a vineyard that is organic, uh, certified, a really good halter vineyard, halter ranch down south in 
and they've been struggling with the regen or label certification which does exist right now regen organic and about tillage you know and they're playing with sheep and you know but you know where they are you know you can't just let plants grow between the vineyards you know in in between the grapes at the same time you can't get crimping machines in there mm -hmm. and you know so so they're just puzzling you know and so forth and so but I think the part of the answer lies in localization, you know, farmers markets, people knowing each other, communities, uh, in trust, you know, which is something that has been lost by the food industry a long time ago. Um, and you just read maybe two days ago how Fruit Loops has been causing illness and sickness all over the country, thousands of cases, and yet you know, General Mills and the FDA have done nothing about it so far, you know, I mean, we don't trust our food system and for good reason. I mean, Fruit Loop itself is toxic, you know, the cereal, but I mean, then there's something more toxic in it than itself, <laughs> than its ingredients, I guess. But so that really, we have to look at our, our, our food system as a whole and recognize that basically it is dysfunctional, that it has long supply chains, you know, that are vulnerable. Uh, and uh, people will see that in the coming year, you know, and next year because of the Ukraine-Russia uh, war. Um, it's a Russian war, I should say, really, upon Ukraine. And the um, so that is one thing where, you know, there's a familiarity, there's networks, there's connections, there's community and so forth, you know. We still need branding things, and I would say the most positive thing that I've seen in this area is the Sustainable Food Trust. And you can look it up, you know, uh, SFT in the UK, Patrick Holden works with Prince Charles. And what they're creating is a, a 10 level gradation. So that as you migrate, as you transition, so forth, you can be say, this is what I'm doing, and this is what I am. And this is, you know, and then keep moving up instead of black, binary black and white, you know, which is you are regenerative, you are not regenerative. Well, I know regenerative farmers who still have, you know, a backpack, you know, on the back uh, uh, and spot spray Canadian thistle. Well, they're not organic or regenerative technically, you know, but they are because everything between the fence lines is, you know, but who's going to certify that, you know? So we need to actually open up that you know, delineation, you know, and description mm -hmm. of what farmers are doing to reward uh, them for, you know, moving towards a system of agriculture that is uh, basically healthy and kind and regenerative. It reminds me of um, Chuck Benbrook's continuum of integrated pest management or sustainability and where you're not either or, but you are moving in that direction of right. getting to a biointensive form of pest management, but also we can apply that in many other circles. And one thing I really liked at the end of, I don't mean to give anything away, folks, but at your last chapter, you do provide some interesting guidelines to help people in like how you might think about regeneration in your own practice, whether it's a farm or a business. Um, and I'd like some of the questions. I'll, I'll put out a few for our listeners, but you'll have to, I won't put you them all. Read, you can read yeah, them. I'm going to read them. So okay, it's like, does, yeah. does the action create more life or reduce it? Does it heal the future or steal the future? Does it enhance human well-being or diminish it? Does it prevent disease or profit from it, as you were just talking about the Fruit Loops? Does it create livelihoods or eliminate them? Does it restore land or degrade it? And, and I one of the ones that towards the very end, does it provide workers with dignity or demean them? And there are 12 of them that you list here. So I'll let our readers or our listeners also check it out. But I thought that was a really interesting way of kind of doing that reflection and, and, and seeing where you are in the sort of regeneration versus degeneration or extractive economy. Um, so Paul, I wanted to switch our conversation a little bit to something that 
I picked up in both your drawdown and regeneration is your use of beautiful images and storytelling that really captivate the reader, engage them. And as I've told my students, this is the type of book that you it could become your coffee table book and it, you might be able to pass it on to a parent or grandparent and they have told me indeed that they've done that and they hold on to this book because they want it for reference so can you tell us a little bit about the power of images and storytelling to communicate um people and and anything you want to sort of mention about that piece of it and how you've thought intentionally about what images to share yeah, uh, I was born in a family uh, of photographers. So I was born that meant and the people that used to hang around my house were, you know, Minor White and Paul Capenegro and Ansel Adams and Brett Weston. And, and then I became a photographer during the civil rights movement. So I was a photographer down in Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, around there. Um, so I've always been uh, and around artists too. We, we, my parents' house wasn't just photographers. They were painters in Deep Aquarium Parks and so many others and so forth. So the, <clears throat> the power of imagery is that it's a different part of the brain. <laughs> it's like that information is very different. Just like, you know, sound is a different part of the brain, you know, like a beautiful flute music or, you know, a, you know, a symphony or whatever and um and words are yet another and so if i gave you those those two books and so for the you know regeneration is 140,000 words here with you know i mean who are you going to give it to like your mom and it's like hey read it you know and she's not going to read it you know and the way drawdown and regeneration are designed by me but was so you could open it up and see what invited you if something invited you it's going to be the image that invites you like that's beautiful, or what's that, or I've never seen that before, or, you know, gosh, I wish I could go there, <laughs> or eat it, <laughs> whatever. Um, and then that way you can read something that's about that, you know, and the image is about what you're reading, uh, and you can stop, you know, you don't, you're not, you don't feel like you somehow, oh my God, you know, Tara gave me this book, I, I'm never gonna read it, what shall I tell her, <laughs> you know? I mean, are you going to read really you know the sixth extinction yeah maybe are you going to give it away to all your friends probably not you know even though elizabeth colbert's book is brilliant okay and so forth so there's a difference between black and white books black and white being copy only and imagery where you are introducing people to things they don't know or understand you know you know in the terms of insect extinction you know but what are you showing this beautiful four chaser for spotted chaser, you know, holding on to a thistle stem, you know, and it's holding it on, waiting for uh, basically to defrost in the morning. You know, you can see all the little ice crystals on this, you know, dragonfly, and 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 and, and, and there's a caption about it, you know, and you're going, whoa, you know, insect extinction, and you, you right away, you, it's like I don't want that one to go to ex extinct. <laughs> you know, it's so beautiful. You know, and it flies 35 miles per hour and it only lives for three, four weeks before it dies, you know, because it's been in the water for two to five years, uh, you know, and you're and, speaking my language. I study dragonflies, so I'm loving this. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, and, you know, they have 24,000 cornea yeah. and instead of two like us, you know, um, and uh, and and the, and they have these, you know, like I say, wings sort of look like ball gowns or iridescent, you know, to attract the females and so forth. It's such an amazing, beautiful, almost mystical thing, you know. And when you see that, then you are open to understanding uh, that this so-called insect apocalypse, which has been named by journalists based on what's going on or the data from the Krefeld Society in Germany, uh, is serious is important you know and up until now you know who thought of insects and climate in the same sentence or same voice or same paragraphs oh well yeah that's the insect yeah that's the pollinators you know like yeah that's a problem oh the monarch butterflies should practically disappear from california that's not cool it used to be a tourist attraction no 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 it's so much more profound than that you know and I'm just choosing that as one out of many and so forth. But I mean, I think you know, you know, and, you know, as E.O. Wilson said, you know, the small things basically run the world. Uh, 
and the insects are at the bottom of the food you know it's it's not a trophic cascade it's the opposite it's an upward cascade we lose the insects we lose the whole tamale we lose basically every bird every mammal every fish within one or two years if we lose all our insects if we lose all our farms within two years okay i mean our fungi explode eating the corpses and then we lose our fungi and in three years we go back a billion years we planet regresses a billion years and it's just algae and bacteria that's what happens if we lose our insects it's like and you know you may not like mosquitoes and you may not like this and you should know who you know okay understood but there's 1.4 billion of them for every person on earth you know and we are demolishing them you know and so so that that's why the image is really important because if you're just coming to people with that oh man that's a bummer but what we do in Nexus and Regeneration is talk about all the things that people are doing, which is amazing. I mean, you know, from verges and schools and the backyards and front yards and, and, and trying to get, you know, working with what I call corrupt regulators, you know, who see the world this way, you know, in terms of, oh, we have to get rid of that insect. You just got rid of a hundred other insects, mister. You know, I mean, with that neonicotinoid pesticide or this or that, you know, it's like, so it just shows then in Nexus all the things that you can do and they're fun and they're celebratory and they're beautiful and, you know, as opposed to, you know, gosh, you know, that is a horrible thing. So it mixes all those things together, you know, so you have a way to absorb the facts, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, but not in a way that's just going to make you bummed out and numb and go, oh my God, I'm going to go make dinner. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. And I think your readers appreciate it. I know students have because it really does draw them into the content. And I like what you said, you can flip through and go anywhere within the book to start that conversation with yourself and to, to engage in that topic. So thanks for, for taking that care to see the world the way you do and present it to us. Right, it's the way I see it because I, I never really grew up, you know, I mean, it's like I spent <laughs> so much time outside and you know people people asked me a question once the during a couple years ago and i don't remember the question but i do remember the answer though that was interesting and something i'd never spoken before but it was so simple which is basically it wasn't safe in my home and so i went outside and i stayed there and i felt safe and i and when you go outside you develop curiosity because inside of a house is not a place of curiosity, you know, switches, bathroom, refrigerator, TV, I mean, whatever. It's boom, you can master that just like that. Go outside, try to master that one. What are the names? What are the sounds? Is it edible? Is what's crawling away? You know, I mean, why this and that? I mean, it's just so amazing. And that's what happened, you know, when I was a kid. And so uh, that was my, in a sense, my education, not in science, but in, in, in curiosity, you know, and so I'm still curious today. I write to learn, not because I know. Yeah, I love it. Um, well, on the note of curiosity, uh, we have some questions coming in uh, from the audience. Uh, and if you if you have a question uh, for listeners, please uh, please uh, feel free to throw them out uh, in the in the Q and A. Um, our first question is from Brendan Fink, Paul. Uh, he asks, technological advances like transgenic crops and EWM are proving to be detrimental in the long run. How can we use technology to our advantage in sustainable agriculture? It's a really interesting question, and it's a good question, really. Um, I, I'm not so sure transgenics actually did help uh, anything or produce more, but the, the data is still out on that one. Uh, but that was the promise, and certainly that was um, um, what we were expecting or told to expect. But let's say it was true, even but, you know, give it, give Monsanto its due. <laughs> I, I can't really, <laughs> but <laughs> um, the 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 thing I say about 
regenerative agriculture is it, it mean, it has deep roots. It has deep roots in West Africa. You know, the, uh, it's unimaginable how enslaved people, you know, torn out of their community by, you know, people, you know, both black and Portuguese, you know, and, you know, and herded up and sent to a place they didn't know by people who they didn't know in a language they didn't understand. And they had the wisdom and the, to put seeds in their hair. <laughs> Come on. I mean, that's so amazing. And so, so much of the agriculture in the South, you know, certainly in rice farming for sure, you know, and uh, peanut farming and so forth, really, really was uh, developed by, you know, uh, African American, you know, uh, farmers. And but it, it came from, you know, Asia, 40 farmers of 40 centuries, you know, I mean, uh, this idea of a sustainable regenerative agricultural methodology, it came from the Milpas from the Mayans, you know, it was a slash and burn, but still different, but it was just, you know, amazing, you know, the three sisters, you know, the corn, the beans and the squash, you know, I mean, all these things came and at the same time there was um, through Sir Albert Howard in India into Europe, you know, this idea of organic agriculture. Um, and uh, so you had these things kind of converging and meeting, you know, and you had Steiner in Germany with biodynamics and stuff. But I mean, all these things were converging, you know, uh, in this country, they converge and with different labels and names and so forth. But what's interesting though, is that, uh, the regenerative farmers, many that I know, are still inventing, still creating, still like, I wonder if I do this, or let me try this, or I'm going to put 25 different seeds in my drill for cover. I'm not, not two, not just vetch and clover. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to start to really think about, you know, what am I putting in my soil? What's going to happen when it's eaten by, you know, a grazing animal? what i mean just it's so interesting and so i consider regenerative ag right now uh, an emergent technology and it has more shiny parts than anything that's ever been made by silicon valley because the number of variables that you have in agriculture are stunning are astonishing and many of which we don't even understand yet which is basically soil microbes we're not sure what's going on down there and um, but we do know how to at least nourish and feed it and we know how not to kill it and harm it and destroy it we do know how to do that and so what you're seeing actually and it's peer-to-peer -peer, it's not like published because the the thing about regenerative agriculture and, and say empirical science which we learned as children and which technology comes out of by the way you know certainly gmo corn and uh you know, you know all those transgenic things are which is if you can't repeat an experiment then it's not true that's empirical science in farming or for that matter every indigenous culture in the world you know is based on observational science and observational science is the science of place because nothing ever repeats hmm. and so now you're looking at pattern recognition as opposed to empiricism. And so we don't recognize that as technology, but it is, mm -hmm. it is, it's weaving, you know, I mean, technos weaving, you know, weaving, understanding experience, you know, together in such a way, and then trying it out and seeing how it works and how it doesn't work and so forth. So I, I don't think we're losing anything by losing companies who want to exploit the land people farmers in the future you know by selling us things that we don't need you know mm -hmm. we still have technologists on the land and they're brilliant yeah we've got a, another related uh, question from uh, lucius uh, could perennial crops be a part of the solution to our current predicament definitely i i i don't know if we'll get to you know perennial cereals you know which is the kind of like the holy grail you know like you just harvest once a year <laughs> you know i mean you know they're doing really interesting things out in salina kansas you know west jackson and in, in terms of a perennial wheat uh and we'll see how that goes in terms of its commerciality and, and yield uh, but uh but perennials definitely and i think the one 
what we've overlooked in because we favored cereal crops so much is actually trees. And there's so many per perennial crops from trees. You know, there's you know seventy very very accessible uh, edible trees that we can plant and intercrop too with you know uh, annuals uh, that supply extraordinary nutrition and nourishment. And I mean, there was four billion chestnut trees here in America. Four billion. I mean. And they were spread by, you know, Native Americans, you know, all over, as was hickory and, and other nut trees. And we had a people here, you know, the 500 plus tribes and cultures and civilizations in North America, uh, who acted as uh, basically keystone species, which is they interrelated to the land and to the forest farms in a way that created more life for those who followed not taking or we won't take any more than they can take in the future that's sustainability that's nonsense they were actually creating more more and more and if the blight hadn't come from china uh, the chestnut blight i mean the trees that were here in north america could have supplied one third of the caloric needs for the whole world without a single farm right there. So, okay, that's what we've lost, you know, but then it gives you dimensionality in terms of what we could gain if we looked at agriculture in, in, in new, with new eyes and new ways and so forth in terms of what comprises a really great diet. And it's not soy corn and, and what was called clear view wheat, by the way, which is the predominant wheat we use has 42 chromosomes and it has types of proteins that we don't have in our body and causes inflammatory reaction no matter who eats it uh, because of that. So, I mean, we're, we've, you know, again, hit the limits going, oh, what were you thinking? <laughs> that, that wheat was designed and made by nuclear irradiation to create a wheat that rose faster for industrial bakeries, okay? And that is the predominant wheat used today uh, in uh, at least the Western part of the, of the country. So um, to that answer, you know, I mean, that question and so forth, you know, I just, you know, the there's just a, a bounty and plethora of, of ideas and techniques and plants. There's 30,000 edible plants. We, what is it, 80 or 90% of our diet is 12 of them, I mean, so I feel like we, you know we've hit bottom, and it's a kind of a good good thing, you know. And now it's about expanding our sense of what's possible. And again, rewilding is so much about that, you know, uh, rediscovering where we live, and what it does, and what it offers, what it gives. You know? So, Paul, building off that that those comments, um, can you say something about meat consumption? Um, Meat, of course, has been connected to greenhouse gas emissions, concentrated feedlots, or also have a lot of environmental externalities, water pollution, air pollution, et cetera. But there's also another way of raising meat that can be meet that regenerative ideal because of the relationship between animals and plants. Can you speak a little bit about how you see meat consumption in solving climate change, or how do you reconcile the sort of you know, don't eat meat to save the planet, but eat meat to for regenerating ecosystems. Yeah. <laughs> if you can tell us. Yeah. A little well, first of all, nobody should try to save the planet that, that you can't do it. And it's a burden. Uh, and it'll just make you feel like you never got your job done. So don't do that. You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> put that one aside. Uh, in terms of CAFOs, confined area feeding operations and so forth for, you know, chickens and pigs and cattle and dairy cows and so forth, you know, they're just effing cruel so before you get to carbon and emissions and methane going hang on they shouldn't be there at all because it is a horrific thing to do to animals and uh, so we're eating that too we're not just eating meat we're eating all the energy that goes into that process you know and we're creating people who basically then look at animals as things, you know, uh, to manipulate and to use and to extract, right? This is extractive industries. Okay, when we get to land, it gets much more complicated because 
land grasslands in forest too uh but uh co-evolved with animals and you take the animals off the land and the land degrades and it, and it, it emits carbon okay so whether it's ruminants or grazers or other types of animals and so forth i mean alpaca to you know uh yaks to, you know obviously longhorn cattle you know i mean bison etc i mean the the it that, that's a co-evolutionary process the reason you know the tall grass prairies were so tall you know eight and nine feet tall you know the grasses and the soil was 10 feet deep was because of that relationship between animals and perennial crops you know perennial seeds you know annuals too um so when we say don't eat meat save the planet you know or think that we have to say, okay, what are you going to do with the land? Who's going to be on it? And what are you going to do with what's on it? It's a really interesting question. And the other thing about meat, and, you know, there's a vegan, vegetarian, you know, uh, keto, you know, all that sort of argument, you know, with, with, you know, all that stuff. Put that aside for a minute. The fact is that people in the far north and south uh, cannot eat, they, Inuit cannot be vegans or vegetarians, okay? So you see the amount of meat that people ate actually being very much, uh, you know, a latitude, you know, in terms of basically the further north the more, the further south the, le the, le the least, you know, because they're adapted to their place and uh, so forth. So in the temperate zones, you know, you can go both ways for sure. And that's where we are. And, um, but the fact is that, uh, in, in, uh, when I was, okay, when I was 23 and I started this natural food company, I won, and, and I knew that being vegan was the healthiest diet in the world, you know, it's duh, D-U-H, I'm like, come on, you know, and <laughs> it's so obvious. <laughs> and, uh, Fortunately, I was a journalist too, and so I did the research to support that. Like, hey, I'll just go research. I lived in Boston too at that time, and I uh, had lots of access to great literature. And uh, I came up with the opposite conclusion. There was no third generation vegan in the history of the world. Not one. And I thought, wait a minute, humans are pretty smart. They're pretty adaptive, and they know how to thrive in place. And we know that because there's 5,000 indigenous cultures that have been here for, from three, four, five to 50,000 years, you know, here, they must know something. <laughs> Not one of them is vegan. Not one. So I'm not trying to, I think a vegan diet is great if you're not reproducing, if you're a monk, you're a nun, you just want to do it. I have got no problem with that. I think it's a great thing to do. But to superimpose that on the culture as a whole, to say you ought to do this and to guilt trip people if they don't do it, I think is absolutely, is absolute ignorance. Mm. Uh, yeah. And it's not based on any data, any facts, any research. It's based on belief, you know, and emotion. Yeah. So that uh, raises a question of kind of feasibility for some, you know, con, con, common environmental ideals. Uh, we have a, another question about feasibility uh, from Mac McGee. Uh, he asks, what is the financial angle here? I imagine that in order to enact immediate change, certain people will need to be financially motivated. Uh, so how does this regeneration ideal uh, kind of square with existing financial incentives, economic structures, et cetera? Yeah, you have to look at it one by one and, and uh, to his question, which is a good question. I mean, that is the question. How do we pivot 180? How do we make our institutions that are extractive and degenerative um, functioning to supply human needs, you know, warmth, clothing, food, shelter, etc., in such a way that it creates more life? I mean, that's the challenge before us. But there are examples, of course, regenerative ag is one. The regen ag farmers I know wouldn't go back for any reason at all. They would never go back from where they came. Why? First of all, it works better. The profits are higher. Their costs are down. The families are safer. The food tastes better. I mean, it just, and, and the, the, the soil holds more water. 
um, in it's becoming a reservoir again. So they're more resilient in terms of too much water, too little water. They're not having erosion uh, because the soil never sees the sun uh, or a storm. In the, and there's always something intermediating that. Um, so, and they are more successful. And the reason you're seeing farmers talk to other farmers now, like, hey, Joe, what are you doing? Or Sally, <laughs> you know, uh, I noticed, you know, whatever. They respond to that, you know, to more economic security. And that's what regenerative agriculture provides. So there's an example that exists right now. And um, so I think uh, when you look at clothing, and I had a, a, a talk today with Everlane, you know, Michael Priestman and so forth, you know, and the clothing industry, which is eight to 10% of global emissions, the second largest user of water on the planet is the clothing industry. I mean, and, um, and so what does that mean in clothing, you know, to create more life? And it's a fascinating discussion it certainly doesn't mean we do what we're doing now, you know? And uh, so companies are really, they're, they're coming up with, you know, leather that's not uh, 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 animal leather, of course, and so forth from mushrooms and different, you know, um, uh, substrates, you know? I mean, they're growing this leather that's basically not leather, <laughs> but it works for shoes, you know? It works for coats if you use it for that. And so you're seeing an incredible amount of innovation right now. I know one company, which is really an interesting point, um, and it's quite big, it's in the billions, and they've approached me about the same question. Everything we make is from fossil fuels. Okay. The question, and they do it for functional reasons on that clothing in terms of wicking and, and so forth, functional, not because it's cheaper, in fact, it isn't. And I said, can we set up a system where every single garment comes back and we only make our garments out of our garments, the circular system? And, you know, it was a really good question. I thought about it and I thought, well, yeah, it's here. You know, that is that plastic, you know, call it what you want, polyethylene, nylon, etc. And what a brilliant idea, you know, no, it's, it's functional. I mean, you don't want a cotton sleeping bag when you're out in the wild, I'm, I can assure you, you know. <laughs> um, and um, so what would that mean? And, and, and how we do that? And can we invent the processes that really do capture it, you know, and not it basically, um, there is a uh, Vietnamese uh, uh, denim maker, you know, uh, Sanji. And when you make denim, it's a weird material because you dye it and then you take the dye off. Nobody wants a totally dyed piece of denim. It looks terrible. And you want that look. Well, then you create sludge and you create water pollution. And what he's done is create a reverse osmosis way of making removing all the water so it's clean even drinkable water and taking the sludge and making bricks for low cost housing you know and so a, a system of manufacturing it doesn't address the source of cotton yet but it de definitely addresses the source of so much pollution that comes from our blue jeans uh and so forth so this is where we are and we're right where that question is and but if you look, I don't know what's going on in Boston. It's a, you know, it's a kind of a, a hotbed of technology and innovation and, and entrepreneurship. So is California. And the number of companies in here that are just exploding around this issue. I mean, and I literally mean exploding in terms of number. I mean, I have investors, you know, people have, you know, venture funds and so forth, and they can't keep up with what's coming in, coming at them, you know, it's just thousands of proposals and ideas and things and so forth. So I feel like um, that's the road we're on. And I think that's a road that's going to win, by the way, that's a road that's going to surpass the old ways of doing things. And uh, it, it, it spells opportunity, you know, with a big O. So, gosh, I have so many questions that I that I have related to that. Um, I know we have a lot of people who are in the business school who are listening, 
or may listen afterwards. Um, can you speak a little bit about the, the role of business, especially coming from your earlier works on nat nature capitalism or natural capitalism, um, ecology of commerce? Can you sort of speak about that role of business and where if, if you've got some young entrepreneurs looking to engage in a regenerative business like is what 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 might you recommend or to get that started and what do you think is the role of business in all of this well i mean what what i recommend is what lights you up i mean that's always the right thing to do and it, it's different for each person you know uh uh but where uh you um sorry I can't turn that part off. I wondered if that if that might happen. <laughs> it, it went off. You're good. I know, but it goes down to my computer. I... Um, um, it, it's really important to to go there, you know, because it's where you're going to learn the most, know the most, um, be engaged the most, um, as opposed to this needs to be done. That looks like an opportunity, yeah, you know it's when those mesh when those things come together and mesh is when sparks fly and things happen and creativity evolves you know and that's what that's what you want to go to you know i mean that doesn't mean somebody opportunistic can't start a business and make money of course they can but i'm talking about a life not just a business mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that's why about growing a business it was about growing you you not just the business and that's what that book was about and um, so I wouldn't give advice as such. I would listen to somebody and said, this is what I want to do, or this is what I love, or, this is what I know, or, this is what I learned or whatever. And, and only then would I say, you know, I think over there is a really good direction because, you know, my limited knowledge or awareness, um, but I would never give advice. But I will say the other thing, the opposite, which is that you know, we haven't really um, been very well treated by our corporations, you know, and even when sustainability came on the scene, you know, and I worked with corporations, uh, advised them anyway, but as I, it was really getting, like I said, the social license punched every couple of years, you know, and renewed, you know, okay, we're doing this, we're doing this, okay, you know, listening to the youngest demographic and saying, okay. And what I'm seeing now is CEOs of companies, very large, large companies, you know, huge companies. And what I see is something that I've never seen before. And that is the, the look in their eyes. They get it. When I mean, they get it like, whoa, whoa, this isn't rhetoric. This isn't about saying the right things. This isn't about, you know, making a net zero commission, uh, excuse me, emission commitment, you know, in 2050 to get that off your back. Oh yeah, don't worry. Uh, and it's like they have children, they have their grandparents. They get it. And they find themselves as the CEO of a really large company. And they have a choice to make, which is to stop doing what this company does, or to leave because it's extractive. It is, of course, does harm without intending to, but it does, of course, or stay there and try to figure it out and try to reverse it. That's different than, you know, hiring, you know, really smart students from Wharton and Evergreen and, you know, Arizona State to run your sustainability department. You know, your kids down there, you know, just <laughs> take, take care of that. You know, and that's been going on a long time. And, uh, and you're not seeing that now. You're seeing really on the, on the board level, on, a, on the C level, C suite level, like, you know, big companies go, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And it's not just a responsibility to one thing or another, it's to the whole thing, you know, and seeing the threats and also opportunity, uh, but the need for to act in such a way that's beyond just, um, you know, with all the respect to Pepsi Cola, well, maybe not all the due respect, I'm not sure how much they are due, but I mean, 
saying, oh, we're going to make our high fructose corn syrup and Tostitos out of regenerative root grown corn. You know, it's like you're killing kids with those foods. Why are you focusing on the ag part instead of, you know, advertising, you know, soft drinks and Mountain Dew to kids? Stop doing that, you know. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the real deal. You look at Nestle, you know, 150 years old, you know, really did some stupid things, you know, 20 years ago in Africa with baby formula, just like, what were you thinking kind of stuff and plastic water bottles and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's like, and they have publicly committed to uh, converting all 1 million farms in their supply chain to regenerative agriculture and the real deal. I mean, and and budget a billion and a half dollars to help those farmers make the transition. So it's not like, here's the, you know, my way or the highway. It's like, we're working with you, you support us, we're supporting you. Let's figure this out together, you know? And they mean it. And, and they mean it on all levels. They mean it pragmatically, they're Swiss, come on. You know, I mean, <laughs> They've been there a long time. They want to stay a long time. And they see that that is the only sensible thing to do if they're going to continue forward into the future in a way that makes sense, you know? So I'm not saying that we can depend on big corporations. We cannot. I'm just saying is that things are changing in, in, in really interesting ways right now. Yeah. It's, uh, it's inspiring hearing you talk about that sea change that you're seeing, you know, you've seen over the last decade or two or however long, given how attuned you are to these issues. Um, I had a related kind of bigger question about the economy uh, and how, how economics is thought about in the environmental community, but then also how environmentalism is perceived by the business community. Um, and I actually remember the first time I heard of your work, I was in Powell's, the big bookstore uh, in Portland. And I was holding a copy of Natural Capitalism. And I was like fascinated by this title. And yeah. these two guys like are looking at me and they're like, what is that? And I'm like, oh, it's a book about how capitalism can be made like, you know, sustainable. And they chuckle and they're like, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, so capitalism is often seen as a problem in environmental circles. Uh, Naomi Klein's a book, it's sub, one of the subtitles is Capitalism Versus the Climate. Um, and there's an ongoing debate uh, between degrowth versus green growth. Um, and degrowthers see economic growth in, as inherently a problem. So how do you think we can go beyond like a simplistic capitalism equals bad, socialism equals good uh, binary? Um, and, and what is the form that a regenerative economy uh, would take? Well, first of all, you might be surprised by what I'm going to say. Um, I wrote an article for Mother Jones, which was the precursor um, to the book. And my editor, edit, it became a cover story, but <clears throat> my editor and I just thought, well, what should we title this thing? Because it was about natural capital. And I said, let's just put an ism on it. So it's the, the modif it's a natural capital ism had nothing to do with capitalism. <laughs> and, and he got fired by the board uh, of Mother Jones, and it was the most reprinted article they've ever, uh, ever published and so forth. The board didn't read the article, they just thought it was about the same thing that those guys said, ah, oh, there's no such thing as natural capitalism, why are you defending it, even putting a you know, pretty face on it. Um, I, I, I do make distinction between commerce and capitalism. Uh, commerce is sacred. It's been around, you know, when Lewis and Clark went to the Northwest, you know, they had those people had shells, you know, wampum, they had shells that came from Patagonia. Come on. I mean, <laughs> what was going on? That's a trade route. That's commerce, you know, that, so commerce is really a beautiful thing, you know, the way in, humans interact, you know, and make things and create things and exchange and so forth, you know, so we have to set that aside as if, is this, as if capitalism represented commerce. It does not, you know? And so the toxic capitalism we have right now is just that. I mean, basically it's taking the living world, it extracts it and turns it into money. 
and then tries to figure out how to hoard it and reinvest it in other things to do the same thing, you know, and it's concentrating wealth. It's just destroying cultures. It's destroying politics. Um, who's paying for the Republican Party? Let me think. Okay. You know, I mean, it's like, and it's not just in this country, all over the world and so forth. So it is, it is absolutely, uh, uh, it has to change, you know, and, but I don't think economic systems change because of a concept. They change because people just start to act differently in their interest. And that's what I think we're talking about here in some of the questions alluded to in terms of, hey, this works better. You know, yes, there's an exchange, there's money, there's value, there's exchange, but that itself is not capitalism. Capitalism is really the concentration of wealth. You know, that is to say, you know, to take things, exploit them and so forth and, and basically extract money out of it and then keep it for yourself or your entity, whatever, and so forth, you know. And, and, and the rest is externalities that, as they're known, you know, basically the real costs are paid by somebody else. You don't pay the real cost, you know. And that form, that form modality of economics is to me just dead. I mean, it's, 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 it's dying and it's killing at the same time, you know. So natural capitalism was never about capitalism. <laughs> it was about the living world and in uh, how to relate to it. Yeah. Can I, I ask a follow-up question to that? Because as I was reading Regeneration, I was thinking a little bit about uh, towards the end, you talk about not sort of changing the rhetoric around carbon and carbon pollution. And carbon, for example, is the currency in nature. It is, you know, flowers give nectar, which is a carbon, organic carbon form to bees that then provide a service for them. Trees provide, carbon to mycorrhizal fungi that then provide nitrogen, phosphorus, and water to the trees. Like there's all this exchange that happens in nature. Can you tell, tell our listeners a little bit about your thoughts on carbon and bringing it back home and carbon trading? Yeah. Well, first of all, what I say about carbon is to stop treating it like the perpetrator and we're the victim. In other words, stop using negative terms around carbon, carbon pollution, decarbonization, negative emissions. It's like those are stupid phrases. Um, and so I'm writing a book called Carbon right now. It's called The Book of Carbon. <laughs> okay, I'm here, you know. Uh, and the first line in the book is carbon is the element that holds hands and collaborates. So that's not a scientific statement, it's just true. <laughs> <laughs> and the next sentence is that notional description of carbon is the guide to how we can reverse global warming. It's like, so I'm, I'm with you on carbon all the way. It is, we have 120 billion carbon molecules in each cell. Okay. I mean, we have 37 trillion cells. You do the math. It's 44 with 28 zeros, okay? That's just us, you know? So the, we're treating carbon, this is all part of the othering language, you know? We other climate, we fight climate change, we tackle it, we combat it, you know? I mean, the othering mindset that we're not mystically, intricately, beautifully, exquisitely, interconnected ways that are just we know and ways we don't know yet um, is a, such a loss and such a such an inept way of seeing where we are how we got here because othering is how we got here we could other the ocean or other the sky other people other cultures other, i mean we've been othering the whole darn place you know this thing and now we're being homeschooled by you know mama by the earth this, that's what's happening Things we call impacts, you know, climate impacts. This is being homeschooled. This is feedback from a beautiful, exquisite system we've been basically degrading. And the feedback is actually an offering, a teaching, a lesson saying, you know, you keep doing this and this is going to happen. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of gentle from a larger perspective, not to somebody who's suffering from it, but I'm just saying, and I'm not wishing on anybody, but I'm just saying, 
So we just have to shift our perspective exactly as you spoke, Tara, about life, which is like, oh my gosh, we don't really understand it yet. And we don't understand it. And we are not separate. And there's no such thing as a nature-based solution. Give me a break. You know, like as opposed to what? You know, Mars-based? How about Mercury-based? You know, I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. Well, uh homeschooling uh, i think is a great uh, a great concept for uh, for us to end on uh and we it's it'll be called the book of carbon your next book i don't know you know you never know until you publish it but it would be called <laughs> carbon or the book of carbon or okay. my wife likes the book of carbon i, I like just... book, i like book of carbon a lot okay good yeah, yeah it's two to one now yeah. <laughs> um, but uh but uh we want to thank you so much for uh for taking the time paul uh and sharing your your wisdom and your your curiosity it's is very infectious uh i have to say um just listening to you for the last hour so i'm sure that transmitted to uh to our audience so uh thanks for for joining us at boston college yeah thank you and i would love if you just send me um the other questions that are that didn't get asked uh, yes, we did. We had a question about oceans and a question about scale of 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 operations. So we will we'll send those to you and then we'll send them back to the students so that they can. Yeah, because I mean, I, I know I learn from questions. I don't learn from answers. <laughs> 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 this is my answers anyway. Right. <laughs> so I find questions like when I'm in a talk, whether it's virtual or not, you know, questions are the gold, you know, because it really helps me understand how other people see, think about the world, you know, not just my little pea brain. And so, uh, and it stimulates things going forward. The what to do question stimulated in, the, in so many ways, you know, about nexus, not so much regeneration, but nexus in the in the website. So I, I really would be grateful to have those questions. Thank you. And I'll just say thank you also for the accompanying websites that go with your book, because it does allow you to dig deeper into the topics and get more engaged. So thank you for all the work that you're, you're welcome, doing and continue to do. It's been such a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. And for all those who are on tonight, thanks for staying with us. And don't miss our, our last event of the year on April 27th with David Meshulam for Speak for the Trees. We'll talk about tree equity in Boston. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Actually, I should have said.